So we've had a lot of rain in the Philadelphia area recently, guys. We had a hurricane that came through. But also, um, with all this rain, it's it's just been affecting the fig trees quite a bit. And, you know, every year that goes by, you gain some perspective, you gain some understanding, you learn from your mistakes, you know, you learn some new things. I would say every time it rains, you gain a good understanding, some good perspective here in the Philadelphia area when you're growing figs. And that's kind of what I want to talk about is... You know, in this episode of Fruit Talk, it's it's just really talking about having a collection of varieties of figs, where I'm headed, um, kind of what I'm I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to. I guess what my plans are. Because I don't necessarily, I'm not seeing a whole lot of value. Every year that's been going by since I started, I've been seeing less and less value to have such a large collection of varieties. I think there was some huge amount, immense value, huge value that I gained by doing this. So I don't regret any of it. But at this current moment, I have found some superior genetics and these genetics go a very, very long way. Um, it's amazing how one variety of fig, I mean, because we've had so much rain, I've had about, I wouldn't say that many are ripening right now, but maybe like, you know, six or seven varieties are ripening at this current moment. And when it rains like this, you really get a good understanding of, well, it's raining, so I can't eat this variety. I can't eat this variety. I can't eat that variety, but I can eat this one. And actually, it's pretty good. Whereas these others, they're split, they've got mold. As tasty as they might be, I can't eat them. And I can't really enjoy them, even if even if maybe they didn't split. A lot of them are not going to even live up to what a fig could be so i would rather have the figs that i know are indestructible seriously indestructible in this climate and i'd rather have many of those than just this random mess of it's it's just it just doesn't make any sense and i think uh once you finally acquire so many of them and you've ripened so many of them and you live in a you know a climate that's just not ideal and then you find some that do well where you live it just it doesn't necessarily make sense to have 200 varieties again i don't regret anything i still at this moment would love to have a large collection of varieties if i could handle it i had the time the energy the space for all of these varieties. I, I would love to have more in-ground space to trial uh, more varieties of figs, particularly in-ground space. You know, I'd also love to preserve varieties too. I was doing that for a bit with two friends of mine, and it just it just wasn't there. The, the passion had sort of dri- has had you know drained away. I do think that there is a huge value in preserving these varieties, but you know, I would like to drive around Philly. There's a ton of fig trees in the city, South Philly, Northeast Philly, even the Jersey shore around here. There's not very many at all. Um, But you can see them quite often. If you go to Italian neighborhoods in the city, and what ends up happening is that I would love to knock on their doors and say, hey, I grow figs. Can I try some of your figs? <laughs> Can I see it? Can I look at the tree? <laughs> uh, 
Can I observe what the fruit looks like or maybe even taste it? Um, can I get some cuttings? You know, it's a lot of work. It's not the, I mean, I'm sure some of the experiences can be rewarding, but you know, I don't know these people. They're strangers. Um, so anyone out there that's doing the kind of thing, I commend them. I think it's very admirable. I think we need to be doing more of this, especially in a place like California. I think that there's a lot of value, but I also think there's a lot of value where I'm at. There's not many people who have found many of the fig varieties in Philly, like the the amount of varieties, even in New York City. Um, I think it's pretty limited in what we've actually been able to access in the community. So, plus, you know, some of those people may not even want you to touch their tree or even go near it. So I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot to it. And I think even if we were to find something, I think there's a really good chance there's probably five really great varieties in the city of Philadelphia. You know, of all the fig trees that exist there, a lot of them are going to be copies of themselves and probably very closely related to Brunswick and Dalmaty and Hardy Chicago and Celeste and Renaishia. I've seen a lot of them. You know, those are the more common ones that you'll find in this area. Um, or even in this in the country, really. But there there are some gems in there somewhere. I know it. And if I looked hard enough, I could find them. And I probably would have something that's really worth spreading around. Um, but I always think in the back of my mind, I think I have so many varieties. And I also... I have some of the most incredible varieties in the world. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think um, one day we'll be doing more of that, I guess. But for now, I don't know. I'm not sure it's worth it. But I want to talk to you guys about, in this episode of Fruit Talk, I want to talk about First off, some of the varieties that I think are exceptional um, and why, really. Um, we did do an episode, potentially a fruit talk, recently. Um, I don't know how many episodes ago it was, but we wrote a blog post about really getting the most optimal fruit quality in somebody like mine my climate. It's uh, titled here, Important Varietal Characteristics for High and Consistent Fruit Quality. And I mentioned in that video, maybe it wasn't an episode of Fruit Talk. Maybe it's just a regular YouTube video. I'm not sure. But we mentioned three really important things. And I want to talk about these three things real quick and how that relates to some of the varieties here that I really, really like or I'm looking forward to trying more of. We're gonna look at some photos as we go. You know, I have some photos that I've taken throughout the year so far. Um, let's do the intro real quick. So this is Ross Ratty. Thank you guys here for joining me again on this episode. Uh, this is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, nine o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen and um, of course how to grow it. So thank you guys for coming back and joining us here again on the podcast. Um, so one quick little issue we've had so far in this season is actually our, our soil moisture. We haven't had the most consistent soil moisture. As things get really warm, I needed to up the water a bit. Plus there was a little bit of a malfunction. There was something that happened. It's a long story, but I haven't had the best fruit quality in July. There were some that were quite exceptional, like this cold and um, grease here. And um, I did have some really good fruits at certain points. Some even in, uh, in early July, maybe even, I think I may have had one in June that was great. 
But for the most part, the season's been kind of lackluster so far, really largely due to water and the amount of rain we've been getting. So it was kind of dry. The soil was very dry, wasn't consistently moist. And then we got just a ton of rain. And it's just been a battle between just trying to achieve that consistent fruit quality. And you know what? Um, the fruits are not as good this year. They're just not. And I've tried increasing my water this year. I've tried increasing the fertilizer this year. I've tried doing different things that I don't normally do. And I think I'm sort of paying for it. Also, last year we had the bags. We had the trash bags on top of the pots that was preventing a lot of water from getting in. And that was the best fruit quality. That year I had the best fruit quality that I've ever had. So for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm super impressed with those, with those bags or something like that. But they encourage mosquitoes, and that's why we didn't do it this year. Uh, the mosquito pressure in the yard has just been too crazy, really because of the neighbor. But um, it's even it would be even worse if I had those bags. Luckily, there's I've seen a lot of dragonflies, and they are actually keeping the populations down, which is really cool. Um, but you know, long story short, here we've had some issues with consistent soil moisture. And I've had uh, some figs that I just haven't been able to pick to perfection because of that, because of the rain. Maybe it was a new variety like this one here. You know, I don't know um, when exactly to pick them. this one. This was the first fruit off of this tree. The inside looks a bit strange because I had it sitting on the counter for a day. But this is Borda Barraquare, a Pons variety. And it looks perfectly ripe. I mean, look at the outside. It's It looked as ripe as it was going to get. I felt the neck. The neck was relatively soft. But, uh, you know, with all these varieties, you got to judge when exactly when to pick them. You know, here's one here that was f fell off the tree prematurely. I, uh, I knocked it off, unfortunately. But this is also from a rooted cutting. You know, some of these are from trees that are not yet mature like this one here is pumping out some really great fruits my Vila de Bordeaux um, we've had this guy here which is one of the best tasting fruits I can grow I'll tell you that right now or you can grow it's one of the best tasting figs but it splits and it makes it very difficult to be able to harvest that and enjoy it um, Also have here the, the Moscatel Preto, similar, same story with that one. It's just, it's just so difficult. Big eye, big size, large cracks, splits, gets mold. You know, it's just not ideal um, at all. So I'm seeing these varieties here that, you know, got a big name. They got a big following. They get high prices for them um for what reason i don't know okay we could do a whole episode of fruit talk we have i think on just that fig economics but i'll tell you that most of them are not worth it um this variety right here is above and beyond most of them it's called sucret and not only does it have the best texture really great flavor it performs exceptionally well, even in lots of rain. Um, so that's what you're looking for here. It's, I'm trying to get that perspective from the rain. You know, I'm observing these trees, observing the fruits in the rain and saying to myself, well, that's no good. So one of the things that we look for here, some of the fruit qualities that we look for here, first off is the ripening period. Um, this is a big one. So we want them just to ripen earlier in the season. The earlier it is, usually the warmer it is, and usually the less rain we have. Unfortunately, it's the beginning of August and we have a lot of rain. It's just kind of how it goes. You can never really predict the rain, right? But 
Also, we want to have varieties that have superior rain resistance, split resistance, cracking resistance, resistance to temperature swings, and above all else is a superior drying capability. And then the third thing, which is constantly overlooked, and I wish that this was talked about way more than it is, is the hang time. And the hang time is just how long it takes from uh, for a fig to start swelling to then be perfectly ripe. And how many days does that take? So it's green and hard. It starts turning color. gets softer. How many days until I pick it? So that's the hang time. And I'll tell you what, one fig I have right now, because I talk about, it's ripening right now. I talk about rain resistance and crack resistance and all that. Um, this fig right here, it's called De La Senora Hivernanca. It's a French fig, or a Spanish fig, excuse me. It ripens kind of late, 22nd of September. That's quite late. That's a late variety for sure. Um, also, it has large cracks in it, you can see here, quite large, and many cracks. And uh, if I got Pons' book out and looked at the English version, I'd be able to read down here. However, even with all that, it has resistances to splitting, uh, actually right here, good resistance to splitting, and then also resistance to the rain. So it is quite rain resistant. Even if it has these cracks in it, um, it's not going to split. It does ripen late. So if it ripens late, it's going to definitely have some rain. Uh, there's going to be rain in the fall for sure. It's going to ripen most likely here in September at least. I give mine a head start. So it's been ripening now. But you, know, you can bet on it that it is going to ripen in, in a lot of rain, as any of these figs do for the most part. So especially a late variety needs to be more rain resistant than others. Um, but this variety, I would argue, is not the most rain resistant variety because it has because of these cracks. It has huge cracks in the skin. And people look at this and think, oh, that's beautiful. It looks real tasty. Look at those cracks. Look at the pulp. Look at this fig. Well, it's a huge disadvantage, guys. Huge. Um, I mean, really on my Violet de Bordeaux, it molds. And usually if you get cracks, even some on the skin, it's not going to split. It rarely splits, but it can split. If it does split or the eyes slightly open, you will get green mold. You will. And you just can't eat that part of the fig. This variety here, Borda Barraquer, very characteristic for it to have these large cracks in it. Now, what I want to say about this De La Senora Hivernanca is that even though it's late, doesn't have the best rain resistance because of the cracks, it has a very, very, very short hang time. I don't know really many other figs I, I can maybe think of three of the many, many varieties that I have I have grown. And this one, by and far and away, by far and away, is the best tasting fig with a short hang time. And the hang time here, as I describe it in this blog post, figs with a three to six day hang time are ideal because by my estimation, it's pretty likely to see some sort of moisture at least once a week. Therefore, varieties that take seven or more days before picking should be very rain resistant. Very rain resistant. Otherwise, a loss of fruit quality is likely to incur. I would argue even shorter than that. I would say a three to five day. If you did some statistical analysis, you probably would come up with, if you got rain at least once a week, if you got rain on average once a week, to avoid that rain, to get a good fruit quality, you probably would want a variety that would at least ripen within five days. Five days is probably pushing it. And I don't know the exact math. I don't know the statistical analysis on it. If I had a variety that ripened with a three to four day hang time, I would 
pretty much guarantee that you're going to eat every fig off of that tree and they're not going to be ruined by the rain. You're going to eat every single fig. So that's what I'm getting at is I have some varieties here that I've been ripening that like Moscatel Preto, like Jade. Well, Jade's kind of my own fault there, but Paradiso from Bode and Italian 258 is another one. Capole Curt Negra is another one. This Borda Barraquer, I'm sure, would have similar issues. I'm not totally sure just yet. But they're, they're just not going to uh, – I'm not going to be able to eat every single fig off of those trees. So let's say they produce the 100 figs. Well, how many of the 100 am I going to eat? That's my point is that, yeah – there's the production to consider, but also now that they, I'm not eating them, the shorter the hang time also, the better the fruit quality can be as well. Um, there's just a longer hang time with certain varieties when they're exposed um, to the elements. So that's a big issue here, guys. That's a really, really big issue that people constantly overlook. And this variety here, De La Senora Hivernanca, has really a three-day hang time. Uh, it's really like three or four days. You could wait even longer if you wanted. Um, but to be honest with you, I mean, that's insane. Is it not? Is that not insane? Three to four days? Um, so... You got day one when the fig starts to swell. At that point, the fig is pretty much inedible. It's not really being touched by any critters, any ants, no insects. Nothing's bothering it on day one. Day two is pretty similar. On that day three, though, it actually turns ripe. So there's a really a one or two day window where something bad can happen to this fig. And usually that's not enough time for any critter, any any bird or animal, um, any insect to really find the thing, go after it and get it and ruin it. It's also usually not enough time, a one or two day window, for any rain to significantly impact the tree. Because it has to rain on that exact day. It has to rain on that third or fourth day. If it doesn't rain heavily on that third or fourth day then I'm good and that to me it doesn't happen very often so I'm almost eating I would say with a fruit a variety with a, with a hang time of three to four days I'm eating that fruit almost every time and you could make an argument all right I'm probably going to eat like 90 to 95 percent of those figs off of that tree so if I got a hundred I'm going to eat 90 to 95%. If I got 100 Moscatel Preto figs, I'm probably only going to eat maybe 50, 50% that are of good quality, um, that aren't going to split on me, that aren't going to have some mold on me. Who wants to eat mold? So that's kind of what I'm getting at here is that I've got a number of varieties here, like uh, this De La Senora, although it's, again, it's not the most rain-resistant variety. It's not the earliest variety. It consistently ripens at very high quality. It tastes incredible because of its short hang time. It's actually amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The fact that a fig can do what this fig does is amazing. It's special. This is a special variety. Believe it or not, you may not know, but this variety has a lot of names, a lot of synonyms. It's also a very highly popular commercial variety. This is a commercial variety that people in Spain, so this one is chosen for a reason. Whoever chose this fig knew what, the, what they were doing. Um, and I'll go to my fig synonym sheet here. You can see here, Hivernenka, De La Senora Hivernenka, Coldenam Kitat, Mora Debu, Burgundia, and I believe these two from Thierry are also 
synonyms. So it's not like this fig's hard to find either. You know, people, this thing's going to be all over the place, I think. A um, couple more varieties like uh, Verdino del Nord and Neruccio de Elba I've talked a lot about. And those don't get cracks. They do not split. Um, they ripen earlier mid-season. They also have a very short hang time. So not only are they extremely rain resistant, they ripen early. But um, I'm going to eat roughly 100%, almost I would say pretty much 100% of the figs off of that tree. Uh, what's amazing about them is you can pick them and they'll dry up on your counter if you want. They'll still continue to ripen on your counter. Um, what's also amazing about them is that they dry, they have extremely high drying capabilities to them. Short hang time. So in about five to six to seven days, depending on which one we're talking about, they're dry on the tree. Cork tints and all. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, if I go back to some of the photos from last year, you'll see what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, here we go. Right in the middle here is the Rucciola de Elba. And uh, I could have waited even longer if I wanted because eventually the Sucret, this is what Sucret is, we talked about this one. How amazing this fig is it also dries on the tree it takes a bit longer it's not as good at it. it has a longer hang time but it's amazing how the Ruccio de Elba is able to do this and Verdino del Nord so I'm just sitting here I'm thinking to myself what am I doing with all of these varieties the big names they're just gonna they're gonna have to go they're gone and I don't know exactly which, what, I don't have a full list just yet. But I'll tell you a number of these varieties I mentioned uh, that we, we ripened in the last few days are gone. They're gone. Italian 258, Moscatel Preto, Paradiso Bode, um, Capole Kurt Negra. They're, they're gone. They taste incredible. They do. They taste absolutely incredible. But they're gone. I just like saying that. <laughs> but it's true. They really are um, inferior in almost every way. If it wasn't for the flavor on some of these, what would I be doing with them? You know? I'd have to be insane. Some of these I don't even remember what they're what they are. I'm gonna have to mark in here so I don't forget in this description here what they are, because I can't tell just by looking at them, unfortunately. <laughs> um. Anyway, guys, so that's kind of really the main message here I wanted to talk about. Um. Black Madeira probably also gone. Um. You know, in this list here, I like to think these are above and beyond the others, but I don't necessarily think they are anymore. I think there's a number in here we could just eliminate completely. It's harder to eliminate figs in these two categories than it is in these two categories, but I'll tell you, a number of these varieties too. Nah, these are all pretty darn solid. <laughs> White Triana has a very long hang time, and we're going to see if that hang time improves now that it's in the ground. That was my big goal this year was to plant a couple of these. I have a couple of them, put them in the ground. They're going to have some fruits. We'll see how long the hang time is. Um, even things like Ron de Bordeaux and Violet de Bordeaux, um, probably long to do. 
you know, varieties I would consider standards, pretty much standards for this climate, they're going to have to go at some point. Because um, even the Violette de Bordeaux, as I've been ripening now, as I've said, with really good success, right? You have Violette de Bordeaux ripening, a standard in a humid climate, a standard that I use against, and I use that against all other varieties to compare it to. It's doing well, but it's not the best. It still molds. It still has, some of them have a large eye for whatever reason this year. It's just not ideal. So I think that's really the main message here. I, I'm going to come back at you guys, I think, with um, a final list. We'll talk probably, again, I talk about this quite often. This blog post here is probably the best one that I have written for people in this, uh, this climate. And we'll go through my entire collection at some point because it's it's large, right? There's many, 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 many varieties here. And, you know, I, I'm going to show you guys hopefully at some point here in the future we're going we're gonna to put together an album because I've got albums. I've got the 2019, you got the 2018 album. And we'll be able to, of course, uh, put these together for you guys and say, all right, well, let's go through this whole thing. We'll observe and talk about why each variety is inferior or not to other varieties that I really, really like. So I don't want to discourage anybody as well, but I think we found some really superior genetics. We put the effort in. We put the investment in as well, and it paid off. Um, not to say that there isn't something out there that's going to beat these guys in the future maybe I don't know that'd be great but I'll tell you uh, we have some really 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 solid choices here in this spreadsheet if anyone's interested really anything in this list I think is worth growing so thank you guys here so much for watching we will talk to you guys soon all right um, see you guys for next week's episode